importance. We speak of a message of life and death. And that is what we were. That's not my name. Anyway, we're going to take care of that later. <laughs> and that is what I <laughs> And that's the message I want to share with you this morning, you see, from the Lord. But before you open your Bible, don't open your Bible yet. Don't open your Bible yet. And if you have it open, please close it for a minute. Because I'm going to take a quiz. I'm going to take a brief quiz. Who knows what Psalm 22 verse 1 says? Is there anybody who knows? Psalm 22. I'm not polling the pastors, but just the congregation. Psalm 22 verse 1. Okay. Don't worry, don't worry. You know it, but you don't know it's Psalm 22 verse 1. Who knows? That's my second question. What Psalm 24, verse 1 says. Uh, what? What, 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 what? Yes, amen, amen, amen. But if I ask, who knows what Psalm 23, verse 1 says? Uh, <laughs> everybody seems to be knowing that. Psalm 23 it's like the, the, the Lord's Prayer in the Old Testament, you know? Because you see in movies that pay some respect to Christianity, if somebody's going to die, they recite Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not, I shall not want. However, the experience is more that I have a want, you know? Or <laughs> I, I have lots of things that I want. <laughs> and. And, and, and for that matter, my dear brothers and sisters, I believe it is important that if you want to understand the depth, the depth of Psalm 23, you must know what precedes it and what comes after it. Because it's not in a void. You see, most of the time we just pick Psalm 23 and it is a nice song, but it, is, it has more to it. And today I'm going to make an attempt to unpack it for you, if you don't mind. Eh? We start with Psalm 22, and you see Psalm 22 verse 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I mean, <laughs> we know that Jesus made those words famous on the cross. And that is the sentiment that we often have when we go through rough times. My God. My God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's how we feel, right? That's how we feel, and that's how we express it. And the psalmist is expressing that too. He is expressing the, 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 the feeling that God has abandoned him. So why are thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? He is actually blaming God that God is not listening to him. That God doesn't care. But it is good to see that as the psalmist continues, he, he, he starts a dialogue with God. So it is okay for us to express our despair to God. Sometimes we want to come before God and only have nice words to say. But the psalmist teaches us we can express our despair too. So, Lord, what is this thing? What is happening? Why hast thou forsaken me? And why are your words, what, my, the, the words of my roaring, why are you not listening to, that, to, uh, to me? And then he is coming to the point that he is expressing his the, uh, his experience of apparent absence of God's deliverance when he says, I cry or I pray in the daytime. So this thing is affecting him to the point that he cannot do his normal work. He is, even in the daytime, he's praying. And he is saying, still you don't hear me. In the night season, still you don't hear me. And I'm not silent. So even in the night, he is praying. He's praying day and 
and night. There, nevertheless, he is not getting an answer from God. And David makes a profound statement in verse 3 when he says, But thou art holy, meaning God is perfect, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. He is very, very brief when it comes to expressing his despair. And then you will see he is very long. He is very elaborate when it comes to expressing his confidence in God. Because if you read Psalm 22, you will see that as the psalm progresses, the, 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 the sentiment of despair is giving way to a sentiment of hope. A sentiment of hope, a feeling of hope. And in verse 19, for instance, he is not saying anymore, thou hast forsaken me, but he is saying, but, but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, haste thee to my help. So in verse 19 now, he is, he's, he's, he's petitioning God to haste himself to come to his help because God is being recognized by, by, by David as his strength. As his strength. Then he comes to verse 20 and 21. To the detail from what he is requesting deliverance. He is detailing them what he is requesting deliverance from. And he states how he will respond when God delivers him. He says, with the declaration of the Lord's name to his brethren and throughout the earth. That's how he's going to respond. Declaring the name of the Lord to his brethren. And, he, and the psalmist finishes first, uh, Psalm 22 by saying that God had forsaken him. No, 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 no let me put it this way. That the psalm begins with uttermost despair to the point that the writer states his conclusion that God had forsaken him. But he is ending in a call for personal, national, and global praise to God because God has done this. God has done this. He has deliverance. And then he, 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 he plots down, he writes down the national anthem of the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd. Let's read it together. Yeah, I, I, I've taken the King James. I usually don't preach from the King James. I, I, I can use another version, but when it comes to poetry, nothing goes beyond the King James for me. <laughs> and Psalm 23 says, one, two, three. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restored my soul. He leaded me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the day of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Father, we thank you that we may dive into your word, and that your Holy Spirit will speak to your people, to your children, Father God, to encourage them, build up their faith, Father God, and for them to know that deliverance comes from the Lord. Father, we give you all praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. When we come to this, 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 this psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, that means, and I shall not want, that means I have a need for nothing. But how do we understand that? Because we have so many needs. Right? We have so many needs. This thing is about a concept that David is introducing here, uh, here to us of how we should go about in our daily walk with God. And I'm going to give you an, uh, an illustration how to, to, to bring it home. If you may be poor, you may not have a dime in your pocket. But if a rich uncle or auntie of you comes to visit and says, listen, I don't know Adelphi, could you take me around? Yes, right? Yes, you, have, you go with your uncle and or auntie all the, uh, about all the places and you don't have a worry how you're going to eat that day. You don't have money but you're not worried how you're going to eat. 
Why not? Because auntie is with you. So if God is with us, why we worry so much? <laughs> you see, we take the presence of people um, as more important than the presence of God. Talking about tithing, pastor, there was a deacon, not in this church, <laughs> but in another church, who came to the pastor and said, Pastor, you know, I would love to tithe, but I cannot tithe because if I do take that tithe out of my money, I will not have enough to come through the month. And the pastor said, all right, whenever you're ready. You know, he was a lenient pastor. Whenever you're ready. So a business, a brother in the church who is a businessman overheard that conversation and went to the deacon and said, you know, brother, I heard what you discussed with the pastor just now. I want to encourage you. Give your tithing. Give your tithes. And if you fall short of anything, come to me. I'll, 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 I'll supplement it. And he said, well, if that's the case, I can start tithing today. So the, the business brother said, well, 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 hold on, hold on. So because I told you I'm going to supply, you believe. But when God tells you he's going to supply, you don't believe. <laughs> ah, it shows how people are so important to us more than God. We have more trust in people than in God. That's why when we say the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it doesn't resonate. Because we have not learned yet to walk with God as if God is a real person in our presence. We always think about God being way up there. But he's right here. You know why I know that God is everywhere I go because I take him with me. He's inside. <laughs> He's within me. But it shows how much we trust in man and how little we trust. Mm. Mm. Back home, if you can, we, 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 we tell the church, if you can't say amen, say ouch. <laughs> The reason why we can be at peace is because God, who is our shepherd, knows what we need. Amen. There was one day, still working for the Bible site in Suriname, I remember I'm driving to work. And as I'm driving to work, I realize I don't have a dime in my wallet, not a dollar. And you know what? I start laughing while I'm driving because I was talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't have a dime at this moment. And it's a few days before it's payday. So I am very much interested. How are you going to surprise me? <laughs> I was not in despair. I just said, Lord, I, I just... I'm looking forward how oh, you are going to surprise me. I got to work, get into my, in the, in the flow of my work, and then I heard, Brother Dara, there's somebody downstairs to see you. I said, man, these people are coming at the wrong time. I'm in the flow of my work, and they are interrupting me. But I decided to go. So there's a sister downstairs. My wife and I had counseled her sister out of a bad marriage situation. And that sister had moved to the, to the Netherlands. And she had sent us a card. And although her sister who lived in Suriname and, and, and I were from the same basketball team, yes, I used to play basketball, <laughs> uh, she forgot to bring it to the, to, the, to the game. So after months, she decided today is going to be the day that I'm going to early and I'm going to give him this card. So I thanked her for bringing the card. When I got to my office, I opened it and I saw 25 Dutch guilders in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the card. 
I started laughing. I said, Lord, you know. You know. This is how you surprised me. If she had brought the card months ago, that money would have been done. <laughs> but it came at the? Another time, I had a similar experience where I was told, a brother is downstairs to see you. And I went down to see him, and this guy I hadn't seen him for years. For years. And he said, Brother Dara, I came to see you. So what is it? What can I do for you? He said, nothing. Years ago, you had loaned me a, a certain amount of money and had promised to bring it back the next month, but I did not. But today I come to bring the money back. <laughs> God knows. God knows. So we need to learn to walk with God. We need to learn to walk with God. Because he is real. He is more than our rich uncle or auntie. He is the Lord. As our sister over there had quoted from us, for us for Psalm 24. The Lord who has the earth. Who, who owns the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Not because I have everything, but because He has everything. And He is with me. And the, the first I want to spend a bit more time on unpacking is verse 2. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. So the question is, what would make a sheep lie down? Comfort. But let me, before we get to comfort, give you a few other ideas. First of all, for a sheep to lie down, there should be no fear. No fear of no threat, danger, hazard, or something like that. Intimidation of predators that seek to devour their lives. There should be no fear. And fear is present in our lives when people prey on us. Yeah. Then fear comes into your life. When they speak evil of you, they cast suspicion upon you or gossip about you. Nothing hurts more than when people you considered friends and allies stab you in the back. The Bible says, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not murder, commit murder. And when you speak evil about somebody, when you gossip about somebody, you are murdering the reputation of that person. You are murdering the reputation of that person. And the Bible says that no murder, no, 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 uh, no one who murders his brother, you know, will have eternal life. So you may be in the church, but if you murder the reputation of somebody, you are in a dangerous spot. You are in a dangerous spot. Secondly, a sheep will lie down when there is no friction. And how do you have friction in a flock? When, when we, you, please imagine this in your mind. A lot of sheep on a pasture. They are not at, uh, positioned at random. The, the shepherd will position the young sheep where the young grass is. Because that is easier to bite off. And the older sheep, the stronger sheep will be positioned where the grass is a bit tighter. You know, a bit more stiff, a bit bigger. Because they are stronger. But... The point is, old sheep are sometimes also like young grass. So when the shepherd is not there, they come around and they push aside the young sheep to take their spot. And sometimes you have those people in church too. You know? Hello? Pastor Cameron said, brother, speak as the Holy Spirit leads, so I'm going to do that. 
<laughs> you have those people in church too. You remember those people? You know, they're in the church all their life. And some new person comes into the church committed and on fire for Christ. And that person is always available when the pastor said, I need somebody to help out with this. Their hands is in the air. I need somebody who want to help me with that. I'm available pastor. And then after two months, when the pastor is has learned to depend on that person, the, old folk, the older, the, the ones that are longer in church will start complaining. He just in the church, he do it like the church is he own. <laughs> yeah, they start gossiping about these people. Uh, he, he just come around uh, and, he's, and he's, he's everywhere doing like the church is his property. The point is he making himself available. Yeah. I preached this message one time in Holland. And after the service, a lady came to me. She said, Pastor, you are right. I'm not going to complain about other people passing me on the road in the church. Because I have been in this church 10 years. And it is my own fault that other people pass me on the road. Because I wasn't making myself available. I was always criticizing. I was always having comments. I was I always knew better. But today I've come to the conviction, it's my own fault. I got to do something about it. And he said, nobody's going to pass me anymore. <laughs> I'm going to do something about it. <laughs> so there is friction. But listen to what the Lord said in Ezekiel 34. And take this very seriously. It's going to be projected for you so you can read it. It's, 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 it's very serious thing to think. The Lord says, I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down. Who? Ah, I will cause them to lie down, to be comfortable, right? Said the Lord God, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O oh my flock, thus said the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the goats. Hey, when Paul is saying that judgment starts in the house of God, he didn't have it from himself. You see, when we are the cause for another brother or sister to suffer, the Lord has said he is going to judge between you and your brother. And that's the reason why you will find that we are praying the right prayers we are claiming the right claims. We are standing on the right promises and we don't see a breakthrough. Because we have to find out whether we are the cause of suffering for another brother or sister. Because God is judging. God is judging. You know, when people are going around speaking badly about somebody, especially leaders, pastors, they feel strong, especially when the, 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 the person who is spoken about is, remains quiet, remains silent. Then it looks like the silent one is guilty. But you know why you got to be silent? Amen. Amen. You got to be silent because God says, you be silent. I'm going to fight for you. I'm going to fight for you. And when, because when, let me give you an illustration, because illustrations speak better than theoretical explanations. If somebody has come into your house, and let's say you have a nice sound box, you know, uh, I, 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 I bought something with, with speakers giving a very nice sound, this thing. You're the only one in the neighborhood that has it. 
So if that thing is playing, you know this is coming out of my house. But suddenly you come home and you hear the sound coming from your neighbor's house. And you get into your house and you see this thing is missing. You can, thief indeed, thief indeed. So you can go to your neighbor and, 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 and take it back. You say, listen, I'm going to wait until he's gone and I'm going to go in his house and I'm going to take my thing back because it's mine. When you do that, the police will come and lock both of you up. Because both of you have been guilty of breaking and entering. But if you go to the police and you file a complaint, and then the police who has the authority will take over, go into the house, get your stuff, lock up your neighbor, and you can continue to enjoy your stereo. <laughs> and that's what I have learned to do. You see, like pastor, I know what it means to be at the short end of the stick when people treat you, mistreat you. I know what it means. But what I did when I understood this song is I, at one, at one night, I took a bath and I dressed like I was going out to the police station. But I went into my living room at midnight, knelt down, and for a few hours, I filed a complaint, official complaint with God Amen. about all the people that were mistreating me. Amen. I called their name, their first name and last name. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I mentioned to God every detail of what they done to me. And I said, Lord, I'm filing a complaint officially. And when I done, I left it, I said, okay, no, the matter is in God's hands. Yeah. It did not resolve the same month, the same year. I had to wait four years. But they came back apologizing. They came back and sent me a letter. We were wrong. But you know what made the difference? Filing the complaint. Yeah. So you have to file this complaint before God so that it is in the records of the police office. Because God is judge. And if this thing is not on his roll, he can't handle anything on your behalf. So you better make sure that your complaint is on, the, on God's role so that he, when he works down the road, he gonna meet your name. <laughs> Said this is the complaint that he filed. And I see this thing working because my dear brothers and sisters, God has said, you have to be silent. I will fight for you. Because when you fight for yourself, you make mistakes too. And then your mistakes become the focus of the problem and not the problem itself. In verse 20, the Bible, uh, Ezekiel goes further to say, Therefore thus said the Lord unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle. Because you have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the deceased with your horns till you have scattered them abroad, therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. Thus said the Lord. God is not going to leave things unfinished. And he starts with the house of God. So, it's a good thing we're losing weight, brother. We're the lean cattle now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we should not take this thing lightly. Colossians 3.25 says something very profound. Do you have it for me? It says, but he that do it wrong, you, let's read it together. One, two, three. But he that do it wrong shall receive for the wrong which he had done 
and there is no respect of persons. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So it doesn't matter which office you hold in a church. If you do wrong, you're going to get it back. Yeah. And that is God speaking to you. And you know what? If this verse was in the Old Testament, you could have said this is the Old Testament. But this verse is in the New Testament. And it's coming from the hand of the apostle that is the most liberal apostle you could say because he was embracing the Gentiles. But he is not speaking to Jews here primarily. He's speaking to the church in Colossae that was made up of Gentiles. People like you and I. And he's saying, listen guys, if you do wrong, you get payback for the wrong you do. And God, and the point is here, and there is no respect of person. So we all have the obligation to be people that are upstanding, righteous, because God is righteous. Amen. Because God is righteous. Thirdly, sorry that I, I, I had to take my time with this part because it's so important. Important, excuse me. Then thirdly, for a sheep to lie down, there should be no parasites or insects that bother him. <laughs> sheep are sometimes troubled by flies, and they have no natural defense. You see, I guess coming from the Caribbean, most of us are from South America. We have all seen uh, a group of cows coming back from the field, go, trying to find their own uh, pen, you know, where their old stable. Have you ever seen sheep do that? Sheep can't do that. They can't find a way. They can't find a way. That's why we are, how you say that, compared to sheep. Because we can't find our way to heaven by ourselves. Amen. We need a shepherd. And, we, and, and you see, cows have a, a long tail. So they can sweep from side to side with the tail to chase away flies. And they also have those birds. How do you call those birds? These white birds and black birds that are always around? Cray? Okay, we call it cray. Back home, we call them cow food boys. That, that, those, those are the servants of the cows, you know, so to speak. Servants of the cows. But have you ever seen those birds around sheep? No. No. And a sheep has such a small tail. So even if you want to wag that tail, he can do, no fly is going to be scared of, of his wagging. Eh? So what happens is that flies would then go into the nostrils of those sheep and lay the eggs there. And when the eggs become, you know, large or you see, worms, then they creep into the sinus. Of the, of the sheep, and then the sheep gets rabies. He becomes crazy. That's when you see a sheep would run and, 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 and bounce his head to the trunk of a tree, bam, bam, because he wants to get rid of this infection that is there in his sinus. So, and once the shepherd sees that, he kills that, you know, he slaughters the, the, the sheep immediately because otherwise the meat will not be good for consumption. So that's the end of it. But there is a way that God, and also shepherds, and David was a shepherd, right? And uh, to prevent that. So what would a shepherd do to prevent sheep to be molested by flies? And you know, flies could be these small little things that happen in life, you know. You save, you save to buy a new refrigerator, and, and, and just as you have all the money ready to go and buy the refrigerator, somebody bumped into your car that has no insurance. <laughs> and you gotta fix it yourself. So the money you had saved, set aside for your new refrigerator becomes your repair bill. <laughs> and these things can happen, you know, these are flies, you would say. They hinder you, they are an annoyance. Yeah, they are an annoyance. It's not that they alter your life too much, but they, 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 they can hinder progress. So what does the, 
the shepherd do? He would anoint the head of the sheep with oil. That's why David says he anointed my head with oil. Because when he anoints the head of the sheep with oil, the fragrance of the oil keeps the flies away. So, that's why David is using this analogy and saying, he anointed my head with oil. So we need an anointing too, to keep the flies away. <laughs> we need an anointing in our lives that all these small things that always interrupt our plans, you know, of progress, that they are be removed from our life. You see, yesterday, sister, uh, Cora and myself were talking uh, while we were waiting for Pastor to come home for getting uh, his daughter Adili. Oh, Phoebe, Phoebe, yeah. Oh, she was, she was knocked out. I mean, uh, she was walking on automatic. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking about people throwing dirt, you know, on, 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 uh, on, on somebody else, you know, on one another. But I, I observed, I made a remark to her, I said, listen, for people to throw dirt at you, they have to dirty their hands first. Amen. Yes. Yes. They have, so they are dirty before they can throw any dirt on you because they have to pick up the dirt to throw on you. But when you have an anointing, that means you have oil all over. You see, when we anoint in church, we just take a little bit of oil and pop, put it on the forehead because we don't want to, uh, how you say that, mess anybody close up. You see, because, you know, clothes are expensive. We, we, we have our fancy clothing. We don't want it to get messed up. But in the old days, when we're talking about anointment, a whole jar of oil was <laughs> poured over you. So that me and you see that when these guys of WWW, they, they were just restless, they always, you know, how you say that, massage themselves with a lot of oil so that when the opponent wants to grab hold of them, they can slip off. So that's the anointing that we need. Because when somebody throws dirt at you, pop, what does the oil do? The, anoint, the, the, the dirt slides off. <laughs> It doesn't stick. <laughs> it glides off. Uh, so that's the anointing that we need. And David is teaching us what, that God is going to anoint our head with oil. And we're going to come back a little bit later to that. But it's because there's more to tell. But what are the flies in our lives? The flies in our lives are the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, etc., etc., etc. Those are the things, if we allow them in our lives, we are accommodating flies. We are accommodating flies in our life. And the Bible says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They shall not. So how do we overcome those flies? With the anointing of God, of course. And by what Paul is telling us in Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit. We have to allow the fruit of the Spirit to be produced in our lives. It doesn't come by itself. It needs an environment that accommodates the production of that. We cannot produce fruits of the Spirit. Because the fruit is from the Spirit. So if it is a fruit from the Spirit, who has to produce it? The, the Spirit. The Spirit has to produce it. We have to allow the Spirit to produce it in our lives. Most of the time, that's the, pro, that's the, that's the tension. Because... I don't care what he or she says, I don't want it. That's the stance that we sometimes take, right? I don't want, I don't want to hear anything. The point is, if the Spirit tells us to do, we got to do it. Finally, for a sheep to lie down, you got to be comfortable. You shouldn't be hungry. 
because if he's hungry, he's going to start to continue grazing, right? Sheep will lie down when they have their fill, when they are not hungry anymore. But it is nice to know that, uh, that, that in the setting that David is writing this psalm, that is the Mediterranean, and sheep were never left alone because they were always in mountainous areas. And there you also have a lot of predators, you know, like wolves and lions and things like that, and bears. But he is encouraging us, calling upon us, that we should be hungry for the word of God. Just like Jesus says, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So we need to learn more and more to feed on the word of God. Because Jesus also said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. It's that kind of food that will cause us to lie down, to be at peace all the time. In verse 3, David says, He restored my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. In, in Psalm 42, verse 11, he is asking himself, Why are thou so cast down? Uh, why art thou cast down, O oh my soul? Why are you cast down? Those are the times, my dear brothers and sisters, that we are down and out, you could say. And why art thou disquieted within me? Now, for a sheep to be cast down means that the sheep is belly up. He is on his back. And when a sheep is on his back too long, then that position cuts off or produces gases in his stomach. And those gases then will start to press upon his airways. So he will not be able to breathe properly. And then suffocation, he would die. But when the shepherd now finds a sheep in such a position, he just not immediately turns that sheep around on his on his feet. He starts massaging the legs of the, of, uh, of the sheep and rubbing him on his uh, belly so that the blood circulation starts to, you know, work again. So that's why sometimes, you see, it takes time when we go through some things because God is rubbing our feet. He's massaging us. He's massaging us so that the blood circulation can come back. It's, and you see that when things happen to you that BAM! Suddenly you are in all despair, you are down and out. And one day you wake up and you start feeling better. Nothing has changed in your situation, but you feel better. Because somebody's massaging you. <laughs> Somebody is getting the blood circulation going again. And that's the Lord who is looking after a sheep who was downcast. So, let's, let, let, let's, let's jump a little bit to verse 4. He says, Yea, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now, the, sh the valley of the shadow of death has one thing. It is dark. It is? It is dark. You know how we used to be afraid of the dark when we were children? No, not, even, or not only when we were children, even now as adults we are afraid of the dark. And somebody, if, they, if you were too, too loud in the, in the bathroom, you, you need to go to sleep and you were making too much noise, then one of the older siblings or maybe the parents would say, ooh, uh, and you would quiet immediately. Yeah? <laughs> but I'm going to give you an illustration of what it means to go to the, the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, excuse me. I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you to close your eyes. I'm, don't worry, I'm going to stay right there. Pastor Kami will keep his eyes open and the video is running. So, and then I'm going to do something. And you have to point out with your hands and find out where I am on this podium. Right? You have to listen to what I'm going to do, and then you have to point with your finger where I am. Ready? 
I see a lot of eyes open still, man. Come on, help me. Work with me. Okay. Where do you think I am? Point, point, point. Where do you think I am? Okay. You see, this is a simple illustration, but without seeing, you would know that I was here. And that's how the shepherd would lead, his, he would lead the sheep. Because for the shepherd to take his sheep from the lower plains to the higher plains, he had to go to a valley or passages in the mountains that at high noon were pitch dark. So how would the sheep know that the shepherd was there? He would take his staff and he would knock on the rocks. Pop, pop. So by the sound of that, the sheep would know that I'm going to the valley of the shadow of death, but I don't have to fear. My shepherd is there. My shepherd is there. So how does that apply to our lives? What do we have that is sticking? Our heart. So as long as you have your heart beat, you and know that God is there. That God is there. It doesn't matter how you do through what you're going through. As long as your heart is beating, you can hear your heart beat. Boop, boop, boop. It's a testimony that God, He is there. Hallelujah. Give God praise in His house. Amen. Hallelujah. I don't want to keep it too long, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip a few, a few things because there's a lot that we can say. We go to verse 5. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. I love that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. In, 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 in the Middle East, you have the four seasons just like here. So when it is winter, the sheep are in the pen. They are inside. When spring comes, the sheep are led outside to the lower plain, the fields in the lower plains. So they can start, because there the ice would melt first. And then the grass will start to grow, so in the spring the sheep are on the lower plains. But by the time summer arrives, those fields are grazed off. You know, nothing left. So the shepherd then will leave his flock with his helpers and go to the higher plains to find new grass. But the point is, he doesn't go and he looks, oh, I found a spot, nice grass, okay, bring the sheep. No. The shepherd would inspect every inch of that field because he had to clean it up. Get rid of all the poisonous weeds that were between the good grass. That's why we should not take information from every Tom, Dick, and Harry. And do not allow the pastor to, in, uh, to speak into whether this is good information or not. Or not because it might be poisonous grass. <laughs> so when he has done that, he will chase away because his staff was made of hard wood. Something like acacia wood, acacia wood, yeah, hard wood. That if he would knock an animal with that, he would kill him. That's how David could kill a bear and a lion. So he would chase bear, wolf, lion away from that field. And then he would get his flock from the lower plains and put it in the higher plains. And then from the higher hills, you know, the bear and the wolf and the lion had to look on how these sheep were grazing, how they were enjoying this meal that was prepared for them in the presence of their enemies. And lie down, comfortable. The enemies were there, but they were comfortable. 
because the shepherd was with them. You see? So when we know that the shepherd is with us, I mean the meal is even greater when there are enemies to envy us when it, for, for the meal that we are enjoying. <laughs> so in the presence of my enemies, God is preparing a meal for you and I. And they cannot touch us. They cannot touch us. And I've always, already said, you know, to the, uh, made the point of thy anointed my head with all what that means. So I'm not going to go back there for this time. And then he finishes off with verse 6 when he says, an ex that's an exclamation. He said, surely, not surely. You know, surely is a, is a, is a, is a woman's name. But surely. <laughs> Goodness and mercy shall follow me. Shall follow goodness and mercy shall follow. The point is, these are blessings. But it doesn't say, I will follow the blessings. I will follow goodness and mercy. No, goodness and mercy shall follow. And the Hebrew word that is used for shall follow is being in hot pursuit. That's when you look at the TV series Cops, and you see the cops speeding behind the perpetrators, trying to catch them and arrest them, that's how goodness and mercy are running after you. But the point is, we, 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 press, on, we press on the accelerator <laughs> and we get away from goodness and mercy when we don't do the will of God. When we don't do the will of God. You see? I came from a very, how you say that, simple family. And I looked around and I said, what I have for myself, I don't want for my children. I have to make a change. Because God is saying, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. You know, they are in hot pursuit of me, so why aren't goodness and mercy catching up with me then? Because I need to make some decisions. First of all, that I want to be caught. <laughs> I have to make a decision that I want to be caught. And because I wanted to be caught, I had to make some decisions what I'm going to do and not do. I had to make a decision that I would follow Christ. And within following Christ, being part of the converted group of people, we still have to make a choice of total commitment. Amen. Because a lot of people are in the church, but not total commitment. They have a more than average commitment or almost total commitment, but not a total commitment. And total commitment is where we need to be for goodness and mercy to get a hold of us. They shall follow us all the days of our life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. They are pursuing us and we have to allow ourselves to be found by the search party that is called goodness and mercy. So when we understand the depth of the psalm, then we come to a better understanding of Psalm 24 verse 1 where it says the earth is the Lord's. So this thing is not limited to a particular spot. That's why I had made it, for instance, people in the days, there were days in Suriname where life was very difficult. We had a military regime for seven years. And you had to stand in line. He knows about these things. Things were scarce. You had to stand in line for sugar, for salt, for potatoes, all this nonsense. You had to stand in line for those things. And I was traveling and I came to Holland the, the former motherland, and I met some friends, and they said, oh, you're here, why, why, why don't you stay? Because you're already here, I mean, don't go back, you crazy? I said, you know what? God is God everywhere. And God can take care of me in Suriname, the same way he's gotta take care of you over here. And unless God tells me to move, I ain't moving. And God has been faithful to me. And because the earth 
The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all that dwell in it. So God is going to take care of every situation that you as a church or as individuals are going through. God is going to take care of that. Because you know what? The Lord is your shepherd. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. That God will take care of us. Thank you, Reverend Dyer, for such a wonderful word uh, this morning. That God, we put our trust in him so that goodness and mercy will pursue us as we go forward with God. Let's just stand and bow our heads as we look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we want to thank you for your word of instruction, of guidance, of counsel, of comfort. We pray that your people would allow this word to undergird them in every area of their lives. So that your favor and your blessings could be upon them. And God, to you we give glory and praise for all that you are doing. Thank you for your servant who has ministered to us. Talk to us from the Bible Society. Talk to us about the way you want to lead and guide us. May we, Father, don't be like the man who looks in the mirror, sees his face, and doesn't know what he looks like when he leaves the mirror. May we be able to recognize who we are in the light of your word. We give you praise and give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. I want the ushers quickly, if you can, quickly before you before you slip out. I know that we've gone somewhat over time, but I want to encourage you to just sow a seed into this ministry so that God can minister to us. Ushers, just move quickly, very quickly, and then you can go to the back, get your bread, all the other things you need to, to get. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. From your generosity, just uh, allow God to, 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 to use you, to bless you. Amen. God is faithful. Amen. I said that God is faithful. God is faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Please remember to visit with the folks at the table. And uh, please remember all the other things at the back. Amen.